This man is the co-founder and CEO of a 450,000 member Food Revolution Network. He's spoken at live events in his career of over 200,000 people total has organized and facilitated hundreds of seminars and gatherings of leaders of 65 plus nations. He founded Youth for Environmental Sanity just at the age of 16 and directed it for the next 20 years. And he serves as an adjunct professor for Chapman University. He's been the recipient of the Na uh, National Jefferson Award for Outstanding Public Service. Freedom Flame Award, Harmon Wilkinson Award, many, many more. He's also got this book he'll be out there with signing after. Ladies and gentlemen, San Francisco, please give it up for Ocean Robbins. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here with you. You know, I feel like I travel all over the world speaking to different audiences and communities. And time and again, I have this feeling like I'm coming home. Uh, you know, we live in a world where it's considered normal to eat food that is a product of tortured animals, that is degrading our biosphere, and that is killing us. And so to be a food revolutionary, I think, means to stand up against the status quo and to stand for something very basic, which is real food that is produced with respect for life and that is good for our health. You know, a food revolution sounds radical, but in reality, I think it is very, very simple. And I stand for a world where we transform our food systems so that they become an expression of our values. You know, food 1.0, I think, is about survival. If you can get enough calories to fill your belly, then that's success. And for most of human history, that's what food has been fundamentally driven by. Food 2.0 is about commerce. We make the buying and selling of food into an art form, and we have today, in the United States, an incredible array of tastes and textures and cuisines and flavors available to us from all over the world for pretty low prices. Unfortunately, food 2.0 is morally bankrupt. And as a result, it's killing us, and it's killing our planet, and it's killing a lot of animals in the process. Which is why we're standing, I think, and many of us in this room are, for food 3.0 where we make health the central organizing principle of our food systems. Health for our bodies and health for our planet. And I think that there are still plenty of profits to be made in Food 3.0. It's just that we make healthy profits from healthy food. That's the vision I'm standing for, is that evolution to food as an expression of the values that we hold. Now let me ask you, how many of you believe that the animals if there are going to be animals raised for human consumption at all, should be treated with respect and be free from cruelty. Okay. H how many of you believe that we should have a food system that supports health and helps to fight cancer and heart disease and diabetes and obesity? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you would like to see a food industry that helps to protect our climate so that it is stable and resilient for future generations. Okay. And how many of you know why I'm already why I'm asking all these questions? <laughs> because it's all connected. Because every time we sit down to eat, we are casting a vote. We're casting a vote for the kind of health we want. We're casting a vote for the kind of world we want. And what we have right now is a food system in which the masses of people are casting votes that are completely discordant with what they actually believe and with what they actually want for their lives. So we're here together to come together with kindred spirits to say enough is enough. To say we want the truth. To say we want to be informed and empowered and activated so that we can have the health and the vitality that we deserve. And I go a step further so that we can stand for a healthier food system so that our kids don't have to grow up with a one in three chance of getting diabetes in their lifetimes. So that two thirds of our population does not have to be overweight or obese. So that we do not have to be losing millions of lives needlessly to dementia, cancer, 
heart disease, and so many other ailments that are plaguing our people today. Recently, there was a study done, the largest study on the causes of disease and death in world history, conducted by researchers at the University of Washington. They published a report, they called it the Global Burden of Disease. This report looked at hundreds of causes of death, hundreds of lifestyle factors in dozens of countries all over the planet. What they concluded was that the American diet in this country was causing 700,000 deaths per year in the United States. More Americans are dying every year from the standard American diet than died in World Wars I, World War II, the Iraq Wars, both of them, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, all combined. But in this case, the enemy wasn't another country. It wasn't bullets. It was our own knives and forks and what we were putting on them. I think this is really good news. And I'll tell you why. Do you know anybody who's hurting or suffering right now? Do you know anybody who's sick? Do you know anybody who's carrying around some extra pounds? Who's feeling lethargic or stressed or hurting in some way or having some fear about their health or their future? We all do, and maybe some of those people are in this room too. The reality is, though, that we human beings were meant to thrive that the status quo of a toxic food culture and a toxic food environment doesn't have to be the norm. See, we've normalized something today that is so toxic, that is so antithetical to our own best interests, that it's like the air we breathe. And we don't even realize how much better is possible. So I think that the data that we are getting today is absolutely revolutionary because we are discovering that we can do so much better. That we could cut rates of cancer in half. Cut rates of Alzheimer's in half. Render heart disease virtually a thing of the past just by applying what we already know. You know, the Tarahumara Indians in Mexico have no heart disease. If you were a cardiologist, you would be unemployed there. You'd make more money selling pencils. And what do they eat? Pretty much the same diet, basically, very, very similar to the diet that the Okinawans in Japan eat. The elders in Okinawa, Japan, have a life expectancy that's about 10 years greater than this country, but they have a health expectancy that is vastly greater. See, we, we have done a lot to push life expectancy up, but a lot of us are living miserable and sick, which is why we're spending 19% of our gross domestic product on disease symptom management. Right? We call it health care, but you and I know perfectly well it's not at all about caring for health. It's about managing the symptoms of a sick population. Right? And so what we find is that in the cultures where people live the healthiest and longest lives in the world, they're also vibrant go-getters right to the end. Right? So they don't kind of have this long, slow slope towards degeneration, misery, and eventually death while medical bills are piling up and quality of life is crashing, they have a high quality of life and vitality until the end. Uh, Dan Buettner studied the Blue Zones, communities where people live the high, happiest, healthiest, longest lives in the world. We have one in this country. It's in Loma Linda, California. The Blue Zones all have certain things in common. In the Blue Zones, people eat a Whole Foods, predominantly plant-based diet. They get lots of exercise. They have strong social connections. And they have some greater sense of purpose or meaning in their lives, typically. Interestingly, Dr. Dean Ornish has done something very similar with his program for reversing heart disease. Now, a few years ago, Dr. Ornish's program became the first lifestyle-based program to actually be approved for insurance company and Medicare reimbursement for the treatment of heart disease. 
Now, we've known for a long time that lifestyle had a role in preventing heart disease, but this is where they actually said, hey, it can treat it. And boy, does it ever treat it effectively. More effectively than all the drugs and the surgeries and the medical arsenal. But instead of having people have to live with major surgery repercussions and taking drugs for the rest of their lives, the only side effects from the Ornish program are good ones. People are happy, happier, they have more energy, they have more joy, they have more zest for life. They feel better. The cornerstones of the Ornish program, a whole foods plant strong diet, exercise, stress management, which is some form of you know, meditation or prayer or contemplation or some, some sense of inner peace that's cultivated, and community and social networks. Virtually the same formula that we see in the Blue Zones. Fascinating, I think. The American Heart Association has their recommendation for heart, uh, heart care, and they've found that they get results in about 15% of the cases that are beneficial. The Ornish program gets results in about 75% of the cases that are beneficial. It's kind of a difference there. The American Heart Association says eat a little less fat, try to watch the calories, you know, they have very, get a little more exercise. But the Ornish program takes it quite a bit further, and some people say, oh, isn't it radical? You know, to, to tell people to eat a whole foods, plant strong diet, and, and Dr. Ornish says, you know, I think it's radical to cut open someone's chest, you know. I think it's radical to remove a woman's breast because she has breast cancer. I think it's radical to force someone to take drugs for the rest of their life just to survive. What's so radical about asking people to eat a healthy diet? Right? So what we are discovering today, what we are discovering today is that we are capable of something profound, which is health, which is vitality, which is mental clarity. Uh, and that the sickness and the misery that is rampant all around us does not have to be our destiny. Now, one of the things I love about the food revolution is that it's not just about us personally. It's also about us collectively. I think one of the great lies of our times is that we're isolated consumers who are fundamentally selfish, that we're just interested in looking out for number one in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Well, let me tell you something. Dogs don't eat dogs. <laughs> and humans shouldn't either. And what we are discovering, I think, is that we are far more interconnected than many of us have realized. And so uh, I think we are paying a devastating price today for a food system that is based on cruelty. You know, 94% of the American public believe that animals who are raised for food, if animals are raised for food, should be treated with respect and free from cruelty. Did you know that we have laws in the United States against cruelty to animals in every state? And in every state, we have laws as well that specifically exempt animals who are raised for food. If you or I treated a dog or a cat the way that cows and pigs and chickens and turkeys are being treated today on a ubiquitous, consistent basis, we would go to prison. But we have a situation in which cruelty has been normalized. You see, the rules say in all of these states that as long as it's the norm, it's okay. And so it's normal to give chickens one square foot of space so they can't even lift a wing. It's normal to put them in such deplorable conditions that they go insane and try to peck each other to death. And it's normal to respond to that not by giving them more space, but by cutting off their beaks so they can try, but they won't succeed in killing each other. You know, it's, it's considered normal to, to take veal calves away from other cows at birth or within a day so they can another nurse, so we can take all of the milk from that cow and send that baby off crying that will never know its mother off to a veal barn. It's considered normal to treat animals with any level of cruelty as long as it lowers the price per pound. And we have created a sick system in which the very flesh of those animals is also killing us. We have created a system in which we have to feed animals antibiotics with every dose of feed. 
Did you know that we face a crisis today from antibiotic resistant bacteria? The World Health Organization has declared this to be one of the top threats to human health and survival and even political survival in the coming generation. 700,000 people around this world died in the last year from antibiotic resistant bacteria. 30,000 of them right here in the United States. These are people who died from diseases that antibiotics could not stop because the bacteria were resistant, right? We have bred bacteria that are resistant to the most potent and effective tools ever devised by Western medicine. 80% of the antibiotics that are used in this country and more than two-thirds worldwide are used in livestock production, not on humans. 80% in the U.S. You could say that our factory farms have become biological weapons factories because we are breeding bacteria day in and day out that are resistant to these antibiotics. They're the only ones that survive and then they come back to us. Projections are that by the year 2050, antibiotic resistant bacteria could be killing 10 million people per year worldwide. 10 million human beings every single year. We are looking at the possible possibility of a post-antibiotic world within the next generation. And our factory farms are leading the way. So when we treat animals with such immense cruelty that they cannot survive without antibiotics in every dose of feed, we create a system that isn't just polluting the environment, that isn't just cruel to animals, and that doesn't just cause more heart attacks, but it actually is threatening the viability of antibiotics for all future generations. When the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization looked at climate change a few years back, many of you have probably heard about this, they ended up publishing a report called Livestock's Long Shadow. They looked at the data and they said that in reality, cows, and livestock production of cows had more impact on our climate than the transportation sector. All of the cars, planes, buses, trains, and ships combined, cattle production had more impact on our climate. So the bottom line is that you would probably do more good for the future of our climate to stop eating burgers and other meat products than you would to make the shift from driving a Hummer to driving a Prius. Because the reality is that, it, that the, the livestock sector is fueling climate change in a bunch of different ways. Number one, it takes a lot of land to produce cattle. And that land often is former forest, in some cases tropical rainforest. When it's cleared to create grazing land, there's a big carbon impact from that. Number two, the actual production of livestock involves a lot of grain and soybeans. It takes about six, eight, ten pounds of grain or soy to produce one pound of feedlot beef. There too, there is immense waste. All of that farmland is getting inputs of agricultural chemicals. There's a lot of transportation involved. The cows are constantly belching methane, which is the most potent greenhouse gas. When you put all of these factors together, if you're serious about wanting to help fight climate change, Eating less meat or no meat is one of the most powerful single actions you can take. In California, we've blessedly had rain in the last year. Very happy about that. But we are in a state that faces some degree of drought as a kind of norm, right? I mean, we, we have a lot of people in this state and we don't have a lot of rain. And it's a challenge for us. And so we will have some wetter years and some drier years, but we're kind of on the edge with water in this state. It's one of the realities of being in California. And so of course people respond to that in all kinds of creative ways. Some people take shorter showers or no showers. You know, some people stop washing their cars. A lot of our lawns are gone, right, in California. Um, and they probably won't be coming back. Uh, some people let it, you know, if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. You know, we all got our, our approaches. And um, so, so the reality, though, is that in the state of California, uh, when you actually look at where our water is going, a lot of it's going to the meat and dairy industry. In fact, 
We use more water in California for meat and dairy than all municipal uses and corporate uses combined. All of our golf courses, all of our swimming pools, all of our drinking water, all of our toilets, all of our homes, and all of the businesses in the state outside of the agricultural sector combined, meat and dairy use more of our water. In the state of California, we export 200 million gallons of water a year to China in the form of alfalfa that they feed to their livestock. This is crazy. So here again, if you're concerned about water, if you want to help have a, a water-stable future for our state and for our nation, one of the most powerful things you can do is to eat less animal products. When I look at the data, I'm overwhelmed and I'm thrilled because there are so many places in life where we can feel powerless and overwhelmed. I mean, when you look at situations like the, the North Korea or, you know, uh, Syria, refugees, when you look at all the poverty and all the hunger and all the homelessness, when you look at all of the ways that our world is messed up, whether you're thinking about politics or whether you're thinking about, you know, media, whether you're thinking about so many places where we face insurmountable, seemingly overwhelming, sometimes almost unconfrontable crises and problems in the world, it's easy to lose hope. And to think, I'm just a drop, drop in the bucket. What can I do? Looking at Puerto Rico, looking at hurricanes and floods, there are so many disasters, there are so many people in the world right now who are hurting. And then I look at our food choices and I say, there is a place here where we can make a difference. And how wonderful is it that the same food choices that are the best for our health, that help to fight cancer and diabetes and obesity and Alzheimer's disease and heart disease, these are the same food choices that help to create a stable climate and that help to further the well-being of animals and create a more compassionate world. I don't know about you, but I think that's kind of exciting because we get to be a part of the solution because we get to take a stand for something that matters. Because we get to know that our lives make a difference. Now, one of the things that happens when we become aware of this is that we want to share it with other people. How many of you feel like your diet is healthier or, or more uh, conscious, let's say, than some of the other people in your life? Raise your hand. Okay. And how many of you are concerned about the health or well-being of some of the people in your life? Okay. And how many of you have ever felt like you try to communicate uh, what you're learning or what you're excited about to other people in your life and you encounter a brick wall that hits you in the face? <laughs> okay. So how do we make a difference? How do we be agents of change and how do we have a positive impact on the people that we love? Well, first of all, let me say thank you for caring. Thank you for trying. Thank you for loving people enough to want to share what is important to you with them. And in my own life, I've learned the hard way some of the lessons about how to be effective in influencing other people. Uh, I was raised, as some of you know, in a kind of unique family. Uh, my grandfather founded Baskin Robbins. My dad walked away from the ice cream cone shaped swimming pool to follow his own rocky road. And uh, <laughs> uh, he walked away from any access to the family wealth. He had been groomed to join in the family company, but he said no and wound up um, moving with my mom to a little island off the coast of Canada where they built a one-room log cabin and grew most of their own food and lived very, very simply. And I was born there, the parents who were practicing yoga and meditation for hours a day and naming their kid Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I was um, uh, five, we moved off of this little island in the middle of the woods to suburbs outside Victoria so I could go to school. And I had been raised vegetarian. Uh, I was raised eating very healthy food. In fact, the only uh, sweetener I ever had was blackstrap molasses. I had about a teaspoon uh, at most on oatmeal uh, in the morning, and uh, that was my big treat for the week. Um, we went through about a bottle a year of it, I think. Uh, they almost named me Kale, by the way. <laughs> because we grew a lot of kale in our garden. I'm, I'm really glad. Ocean is such a, such a conservative option. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, I, I, was, I started going to school, and I, I didn't have a lot of uh, social skills. And I was very passionate about 
food choices, and I, I kind of kept my mouth shut for a little bit. But in second grade, I decided the time had come to take my stand uh, and speak speak my values to the world. And uh, so uh, I actually got into the habit at lunchtime. Uh, I would travel around and um, I would interrogate my friends about the contents of their Star Wars figures and Cabbage Patch Kids lunch boxes and um, tell Susie about how, you know, that roast beef sandwich had been a sentient being only a few days earlier. And um, one day, uh, my friend Damien and I really got into it. Um, I asked him if he believed in the death penalty uh, for the murder of sentient beings, and he was kind of puzzled by why I would ask, and then I, I no noted to him that his chicken sandwich was a product of murder, and I told him that I was glad my body wasn't a graveyard. Um, and he, uh, what I'll say is that by the end of our fist fight, his sandwich was in the garbage, and I was in the principal's office. And I had some time to think about the fact that I was preaching compassion and nonviolence and I was getting in a fist fight with my best friend. <laughs> and I realized then that maybe there was something wrong with this picture. And that if I actually wanted to be a stand for compassion, maybe I needed to learn how to practice it with the people around me. And that was easier said than done. Because isn't it sometimes easier to be right to be certain of our rightness than it is to actually be in relationship with other people who might not agree with us. Um, but the journey began. And over the years, I practiced it and learned and discovered. And I came to hear a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, you have no um, moral authority with those who can feel your underlying contempt. And it struck me so deeply that when we hold people with contempt, when we judge people, when we pathologize them, uh, we lose moral standing in that relationship. And we lose the ability to have influence. I think when there is connection, we have traction. And from that traction, we have influence and the ability to make a difference. And when we judge and pathologize people, we actually lose connection to that which is true in them. And we tend to evoke their defensiveness, their own judgmentalness, their own reactivity, rather than their trust. So over the years, I came up with a few principles that I think are perhaps helpful in how to be a positive influence on other people when we want to be an advocate for something we believe in. And one is to ask questions, to listen, know who you're talking to, and know what they care about. You know, for some younger people, maybe they're more influenced by concern about the planet or concern about animals. A lot of young people, cancer and heart disease are not even on their minds unless they're struggling with weight issues and then maybe that's an entry point, right? Uh, for some folks, they're more concerned about a cancer threat or some immediate health issue that they're afraid of or that's been running in the family and it's very personal and intimate for them. So you find the point of traction and connection by asking questions and learning about people. And then number two is speak, you know, because you'll never communicate effectively if you always bite your tongue. So look for openings and then don't be afraid to take them. And then when you do that, speak with respect, speak with compassion, and always hold people with dignity. And then the next piece is walk your talk. Right? Because when you're able to practice healthy eating, there's nothing more fun than seeing people look at you and be like, wow, how did you lose all that weight? Or, wow, you've got a vibrant smile. Or, wow, you have so much energy. How do you do it? Right? So when you're able to embody healthy eating, then that naturally makes people want to be more like you. Right? And it starts with practicing it yourself. And then another principle, I think, is... Um, is to always love people. You know, in families, people tend to be around food differences the way around they are around every other kind of difference. Families that are characterized by toxic relationships, by judgment and biting sarcasm and meanness are going to bring that to food conversations and differences just like they will to politics, just like they will to any other area that might be a source of difference within the family. 
when you can bring more love, more community, more connection, more gratitude, more respect into a family culture, that's going to affect conversations about food and about everything else. Uh, I think that gratitude is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. We have a plethora of medical studies that have shown that the simple act of taking five minutes a day to write down things you're grateful for doesn't just make things feel better, it actually makes them get better. So the act of sitting around the table at a family dinner and everyone just saying one thing they're thankful for from the day builds a sense of community and cohesion and connection and it also puts the body into a receptive state where you're better able to absorb and digest the nutrients in the food that you eat. We don't just need to practice Thanksgiving one day a year around a dead turkey. We can practice it every day of our lives. As we ask, even if it sounds mundane, even if you're in a heartbreakingly, devastatingly brutal moment, what is something I'm grateful for? Maybe the best you can do is that you're still breathing. Maybe the best you can do is that your heart's still beating or that you can even think enough to, to ask the question, what am I grateful for? But there's always something. There's always some cause for gratitude, for respect, for reverence. And I think that what we appreciate appreciates. I think that where we put our consciousness expands. So to me, the food revolution isn't just about saying no to the bad stuff. I mean, we have to indict the status quo. We have to recognize the immense cost that's coming from a toxic food culture, from all the processed junk and all the tortured animals and all of the, the uh, food-like substances that masquerade as normal in our food world today. But we also have to stand for something beautiful. We have to love our farmers and our land and our soil and give thanks you know, whether or not the people who are, grew our food were treated with respect, whether or not they lived with dignity, we can still give thanks that their labor enabled us to eat. We can still give thanks that we have the opportunity to eat at all, and that we have the opportunity to nourish our bodies, and hopefully to make conscious choices about how we nourish our bodies. Speaking of farm workers, did you know that life expectancy for farm workers in the United States today is about 49 years? Did you know that the people who are actually in the fields growing our food are the most impacted by the chemicals that are used in the production of that food? They are the ones who are interacting with the insecticides and the neurotoxic poisons that are sprayed on our fields. In a sense, they're like the canaries in the coal mine. And it doesn't take a coal miner to know that when the farm workers are dying of cancer in massive rates, and when their life expectancy averages 49 years, that says something about the food, right? That we're eating. So to me, when we look at organic food, there are all kinds of reasons to go organic if you can afford to do so, right? They include the impact on the climate, they include the impact on our water and the future of our soil and the viability of our agricultural, agricultural systems. They include the impact of consuming those neurotoxic pesticides on your health, on your likelihood of getting cancer down the road. And they also include the impact on the people who are growing the food we eat. And to me, I don't want my food to be a product of torture of animals, and I also don't want it to be a product of a torture of humans. And so one of the reasons that I choose to favor organic food as much as possible is because I want to be in integrity as much as I can with the values I hold and with the world I want. I don't want the food that I eat to be fueling suffering and misery and disease and death for anybody. Now, <laughs> now that said, we have to do the best we can with what we've got. And we have an agricultural system right now that actually favors and drives down the price for junk food. It does this in many ways. Take organics, for example. The, the organic industry, in order to be a certified organic, has to pay a significant price for that certification to prove that it wasn't using 
neurotoxic pesticides and dangerous herbicides and cancer-causing glyphosate and all these other substances, right? What would happen if the regulatory burden was put on the other guys? What would happen if instead of making organic farmers pay a premium price and then pass it on to the consumer to prove they didn't use poisons? What would happen if the folks who are using the poisons had to have inspectors come to their farms, had to put on their labels what poisons they used, had to prove that they weren't out of compliance and weren't using too much of this junk, and had to be transparent about it? Suddenly the price dynamic would shift, wouldn't it? See, right now we've got a system where it's kind of like you're being fined for wearing your seatbelt. <laughs> Another level of it is the commodity subsidy system. The United States Department of Agriculture issues tens of billions of dollars a year in subsidies for commodities crops. Most of that is going to corn and soy that are genetically engineered as well as wheat. These crops are being mostly fed to livestock and turning into highly processed things like high fructose corn syrup and winding up in our white breads, right? So what we have is a system where instead of subsidizing things like nuts and seeds and, and fruits and vegetables and legumes, the things we know we should be eating more of, we're subsidizing factory farm animal products, high fructose corn syrup, and the highly processed additives that are ubiquitous in our dominant toxic food culture. What would happen if we re redirected that? I mean, you don't have to be some kind of a, you know, whether, whether you're a libertarian who wants no government spending or whether you're a, you know, socialist who wants everything government, like, any way you slice it, this is crazy, right? Like, at least we should stop subsidizing the bad stuff. And if we're going to subsidize anything, shouldn't we be subsidizing healthy food? Yeah. And there have been a few experiments done where food stamps, the SNAP program, uh, as it's called, the Supplemental Nut Nutrition Assistance Program, were, uh, were shifted so that, uh, number one, they stopped being uh, allowed to be used for sugary sodas, uh, but also, perhaps more importantly, they doubled the value for produce, fresh fruits and vegetables. Now here's what happened when they did that, and if they've piloted this in a few communities, consumption of fruits and vegetables went up a lot in those communities. They've also started making it so that people can use the, the food stamps uh, in farmers markets. It, and in fact, m majority of the farmers markets in the United States now have at least one vendor, if not multiple vendors, that can take them. These are the kind of steps we can take if we want to help healthy food reach everybody. See, I, it's not okay with me that we think that whole foods take your whole paycheck. It's, it's not okay with me to think that healthy food is only going to be available to the elite, to the privileged few, while people who are struggling to survive are left with the junk. As a food revolutionary, I want a world where everybody has access to safe, healthy food for themselves and their families. You should not have to choose between eating organic food and paying rent. You should not have to choose between surviving today and getting cancer tomorrow. You should be able to do the right thing for your family and be able to afford to do so. Did you know that rates of diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and all of the other chronic diseases that are diet-fueled are the highest in low-income communities and communities of color in this country? See, I think that food is one of the most prominent social justice issues of our times. If you want a world where kids, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their economic background, how lucky they got in the womb lottery, have a chance at a healthy life, if you want a world where kids can grow up with the mental power to be able to succeed in the school tests, where they can have the energy to get through the day and get, eventually get a good job. If you want a world where everybody, regardless of their background and privilege, has a fair shot in life, then I think that increasing the access and the affordability of healthy food is one of the most powerful steps that any of us can take. And we are seeing progress, slow but important. The Los Angeles Unified School District 
is now offering a meat-free Monday program. They're also, uh, they're also offering school, focusing on having more school gardens. We're finding that when kids grow vegetables, they eat vegetables in higher numbers. And the, the obesity rate in the LA Unified School District, while it's been going up everywhere else, it's going down there. Yep. In the state of Iowa, tens of millions of dollars have been raised to try to turn the entire state of Iowa into a blue zone. Following on Dan Buettner's work and looking at how they can implement it in Iowa. I figure if they can do it in Iowa, they can do it a lot of places. This isn't San Francisco here, right? Uh, so I think there are a lot of steps being taken and people are realizing that the toxic status quo is enough. We are fed up with toxic food. We're sick of being sick. We're sick of seeing our kids be getting sick and we're hungry for change. And together, step by step, we are standing for that change and we are living that change and we are eating that change and we're sharing that change with friends and with loved ones. I have tremendous hope. Did you know that in the United States farmers markets have quadrupled in the last 15 years? Did you know that community supported agriculture programs have also quadrupled? Did you know that sales of organic food have been skyrocketing like nobody's business and sales of natural foods have also been exploding? When I was a kid health food stores were places where uh, well, they were small, they weren't very well lit. I remember whole wheat bread was something that was kind of like maybe about a week old. You were lucky if it didn't have mold on it. And it tasted pretty bad, to be honest with you. Um, and now they've changed. You know, now they're, they're big and bright and accessible and even places like Safeway are stocking natural and organic foods and displaying them with pride. Because we've crossed a tipping point where health food isn't just for hippies and weirdos anymore. <laughs> you can still be a hippie or a weirdo if you want to, but it's also become something that more and more people take an interest in. You know, 75% of the American public ate something organic last year and knows enough in surveys to say that because the word has become mainstream. And more and more people are learning and it's not an all-or-nothing proposition. I mean, some people choose to go all the way, go 100% plant-based, go vegan. That's wonderful if that's what you want to do. Um, but I'm also a big fan of helping move in a direction. Rather than saying this is the goal, is like at this end of the field, in this spot, I'm interested in how we can help as many people as possible move. And whether you move to 50%, 75%, 99%, 100%, 110%, .100%, it's up to you, right? Um, everybody has to listen to their body and make choices that are in alignment with their conscience, with their ecosystem, with their financial resources, with their values, with their social context. Right? But we can all move in this direction towards more healthy, more conscious, more sustainable, more real food and less processed junk, less cruelty, less environmental destruction and less poisons. And when we make this move, we don't just do so for ourselves. We do so for animals, for children, for communities, for farm workers, for the planet. And food is social. So our movements also influence all the people we interact with who see us eating in a new way, who see us living in a new way. It becomes more cool. It becomes more socially acceptable. And the world slowly begins to change. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being a part of a food revolution, for taking a stand for a healthier life, and for being an agent of change on this planet. And I want to close with a quote from George Bernard Shaw, who said, This is the true joy in life, to be used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, to be a force of nature, instead of a feverish clod of ailments and grievances, complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. He said, I'm a member of the community, and as a member, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can before I die. Life is no brief candle to me. It's more of a splendid torch, which I want to burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. So I want to thank you for burning your candle or your torch as brightly as you can, for seizing the moment, for taking a stand with your life and with your food choices on behalf of all that you love. Thank you so much.
I think we can take about five minutes for questions and answers. I know we'll need the room uh, soon, but uh, let's just take a few if you want to. Yes? When was the last time you had a meeting with Jerry Brown? Last time I had a meeting with Jerry Brown? I have uh, uh, I'm, uh, about 15 years. Yeah, I haven't met with Jerry Brown since he, before he was the mayor of Oakland, actually. Maybe it was 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about um, organics. Um, there's definitely sometimes organics are being almost as double as conventional. Yeah. And besides the, the dirty dozen things, yeah. With organics, okay, so here's the thing with organics. If you can't afford vegetables, some people are like, oh, I'll just eat processed junk because I, at least it's organic. Well, let me tell you something. Non-organic kale is a heck of a lot healthier than organic Doritos. <laughs> So, you know, the studies that have been done that have shown that people have huge health benefits from eating more fruits and vegetables, most of those fruits and vegetables were not growing organically. And they still got huge results. So the most important thing, I think, is to focus on the healthy foods. And, and then number two, if you can go organic, the most important things to focus on are those organics that are in the dirty dozen from the environmental working group. Um, if you can make those organic, you're avoiding the most pesticide contaminated foods. In general, foods that have a shell, whether it's an avocado or a melon or a mango that you remove, Organic is less important from a personal pesticide exposure standpoint because you're going to remove that outer casing. Um, you can look at Environmental Working Group online and find the Clean 50 and the Dirty Dozen and get a whole ranking. Um, obviously, the pesticide contamination is, issue is more than just for our own health, but it's still a helpful guide. Um, and sometimes you don't, you don't necessarily have the resources to pay twice as much for organic food. And I want to say, don't let that stop you from eating healthy food. Yeah. Grass-fed versus factory farm beef. So, so here's the thing, and in general, animal products, grass-fed. So first of all, let me say that there's a lot of greenwashing where companies are trying to sound ethical and humane, and it's not what it sounds like. Let's take eggs for a, a good example. So uh, we have cage-free, so we have regular conventional eggs, then we got cage-free, then we got free-range, then we got pasture-raised. So in the conventional system, chickens have about one square foot per bird. In uh, cage-free, there's actually no particular regulation. It just means that they can move around, but there could be five or 10,000 birds. They still might only have one square foot per bird. They still might live their whole lives in a, in a warehouse. In free range, it means they have some access to the outdoors and they have to have at least five square feet per bird. Um, but many of them still live indoors in a warehouse. And in pasture bays, they have 70 square feet per bird. So if you're going to eat eggs or any other animal product, pasture raised is definitely a big step forward in terms of humane practices and usually it costs a lot more. Um, now my personal perspective is that for people who want to eat animal products, that's the way to go, right? Is more pasture raised because we want them to be treated ethically. From an environmental standpoint, it's better. Um, and from a um, uh, health perspective, those products tend to be free of antibiotics and hormones and a lot of the other junk. They tend to be lower in fat and so there's some benefits there. That said, is it a health food? Well, that's arguable. But I think less meat is a big part of the movement we need to go in. And for those who do eat animal products, I think better meat by which I mean more humane, more respectful. It's all part of the food revolution to me. It's all moving in a direction. Uh, some people are going to say 100% vegan, more power to you if that's the direction you want to go. Some people aren't going to want to go that far. And I say, well, in that case, then pasture raised is a great, is a great part of the journey too. Yep. Okay, so as you all may know, the average physician in all their years of medical school gets 19 hours of training in nutrition, right? Which is, you know, you and I could get that in a couple of days, right? And we'll know more than they do. Uh, you know, we have, we have um, a medical industry that acts as if food didn't matter, for the most part. Um, we've got a food industry that acts like health didn't matter. 
Um, and so in that context, it becomes up to each of us to get informed. That said, doctors have a lot of power. They're interacting with people in life or death situations. They're telling them what to do in the face of sometimes crises that threaten their very lives themselves. And we need to get this education out there into the medical world. Um, we could be cynical, and we, but we can't give up on this community. And there are a lot of doctors who actually want to help people and they actually care about people. And so we've got to spread this knowledge and the Food Revolution Network is actually preparing to take on a campaign. Our goal is to get nutrition taught in medical schools and our number one uh, strategy around that is a petition to the National Board of Medical Examiners. Uh, doctors have to, in order to graduate medical school, they have to pass some tests. And those tests uh, at, the, at present time have absolutely no focus on whole foods nutrition. None. And so we think that medical schools are teaching to the test. And if the National Board of Medical Examiners, which administers those tests, will put whole foods nutrition onto the tests, then doctors will be taught it. And the medical schools will be incentivized and have to teach it. And that could be a kind of acupuncture point, if you will, for creating systemic change. So we want to embarrass the National Board of Medical Examiners. And we want to also challenge them to serve the education of incoming physicians. And then we also want to have programs for CEUs, for all the doctors who are already practicing. You have to stay up to speed. We have to keep more nutrition getting out there so they can do their annual CEU credit work in a way that helps inform their practice. Yeah. Last question. OK. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I love to see that it's, it's great to have a bottom up, but I love to see the top down. Yeah. And one of the places I think, I think a lot of people Yeah. That 14% of millennials are plant-based, and right. it's, it's in their interest, and it's in everyone's interest. What are, what are you doing in terms of talking, or do you know people <coughs> talking to the restaurant association to try to encourage the change, so that so we enable the lifestyle? Well, I, I, it might, you know, from my perspective, um, there is a lot of change happening in the restaurant industry. Um, I mean, I, I just want to acknowledge that. Yeah. yeah. Understood, I understood, yeah. What I'm saying is that when I was a kid, most restaurants in America did not have a vegetarian option on the menu. And today, most do. McDonald's doesn't, unless you call, count french fries as food. Um, and it may not be vegetarian anyway, but, uh, but, but most are starting to, right? And, and you can order off the menu. And I think we make change when we ask for vegetarian or whole foods options. When we ask the server for something that isn't on the menu, and maybe we can also go a step further. Maybe we can ask the manager, ask to speak with the manager and say, hey, I want you to know that I love the atmosphere in your restaurant and I really wish you had food I could eat. You know? And, and so do my friends who aren't coming here at all to even tell you that. Right? Wouldn't it be awesome if you added to your menu X, Y, or Z, right? Make suggestions. Be constructive and positive. You can start calling local restaurants. You could call every restaurant in your area, in your neighborhood, and say, hey, do you offer a vegetarian option? Do you offer a Whole Foods vegetarian option? Oh, what is it? Oh, it's just salad with bacon? Okay, that's actually not vegetarian. You know, you can kind of challenge and question and raise it and ask if they can submit a comment to the manager or the owner. Right? So, top down. Right. You might, you might be the person to do that. So, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. No one's gonna, no one's gonna do this for us. But it's amazing how powerful you can be in creating change when you are passionate and motivated and you're on the side of the truth. So whatever your niche is, we need a biodiversity of tactics in this movement. Yeah, uh, I'll be available to answer questions right back here. So go ahead and find me if you have more, if you want to get a signed copy of my book, Voices of the Food Revolution, right outside here. Thank you so much.